This is the third video that I'm doing on the zero axis Trojan. In the first video, I gave an overview of the Trojan and I talked about uh, what it did at a high level. And then in the second video, I talked about what initially happens on installation, as well as how the zero axis Trojan stays resilient. Uh, in this video, what I'll do is I'll talk a bit more about the underlying peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnet aspects of zero access. So when zero access installs on a particular system, uh, one of the first things it does is it actually talks to a central server. And the Trojan basically will transmit to the central server some information about its coordinates and about its configuration and its architecture. Okay? The underlying IP address of the server is actually hard-coded inside of the binary itself. Now during this initial communication, what happens is that zero access provides the server with a special randomly generated string. And actually it's technically a random domain, although I don't like to use the word domain to describe it. And I'll, I'll explain why in a moment, why I'm not describing it as a domain, because I think it actually can be more confusing to describe it that way. But really the idea is that this random string or this random domain is something that's generated uniquely each day uh, by an algorithm that is encoded inside of the underlying Trojan itself. Okay. Now, what actually happens is this particular randomly generated domain is not something that the server will ever connect to, or really that anybody will ever connect to. And that's why I don't really like to call it a domain, because no one's actually ever going to connect uh, to this domain ever. What the server actually does, and actually, maybe I should take a step back and, and remark that when you look at typical malware, especially botnets, uh, when they do create random domains, they actually do create domains that they connect to. Uh, and they do that primarily for resiliency reasons, since they have if they have, let's say, a long list of domains, then they can go down that list uh, in case any of their regularly maintained servers are unavailable. So for example, if a server was taken down uh, because a security researcher found it and took it down, or because a vendor was able to find it and take it down, uh, then that server may not be available. But if you have a list of domains you can go to, you may be able to find other alternatives to some of your original servers. Now, as I mentioned, the zero access Trojan itself doesn't use randomly generated domains for this purpose, as far as I can tell, at least right now. Instead, what it does is that the server basically will check if that randomly generated string was one that could have been generated by the zero access Trojan. And if so, um, it'll go ahead and it'll keep the communication going. If not, it'll abandon the communication. And so effectively, in this case, the underlying domain, this randomly generated string, serves as more of an authentication token. Okay, it's actually used for doing authentication of the client to the server. And so the server can now tell if it's talking to a legitimate zero access client. Okay. Now, why is this beneficial? Well, it turns out that if you have client authentication, that reduces the risk of a security switcher from, let's say, reverse engineering the protocol or otherwise figuring out how the, the client server protocol works by trying to pose as a, a client. So for example, if you have a researcher here and he's trying to interact with the server, um, he may not be able to figure out what's going on because the server will know that this researcher is not a legitimate instance of the zero access Trojan because the researcher may not have been able to come up with that same random domain that could have been generated only by the algorithm inside of the zero access Trojan binary. Okay. Uh, now, if there's no authentication, then a clever security researcher can go and he can not only understand the protocol, he may be able to potentially co-opt the entire server and even go as far as get the server to uninstall the bot from infected systems. And these kinds of things have been known to happen in the past with bot networks. Okay. Uh, the other benefit of having authentication from the malware author's perspective is that it does provide them with an indication of how many installs they get of their underlying uh, bot infections. Okay. Now zero access in particular, when you have a zero access infected host, it tries to become part of a botnet. And this is actually a peer to peer botnet uh, where you may have many many nodes, and these nodes are now connected to each other. And it's through participation in this peer-to-peer -peer botnet that uh, many aspects of zero access functionality uh, take place. Like for example, the click fraud aspects are, are done in this way and, and, and so on and so forth. And I do actually want to point out that I've made some other videos that talk about peer-to-peer -peer botnets, and you should check those out if you want more details on how peer-to-peer -peer botnets work in general. Uh, for zero access in particular, the approach that it's used has actually changed in some minor ways over time. It's evolved. So what I'll do is I'll describe it at a higher level so that it's going to be consistent across different 
variations of the zero axis Trojan. Okay. Now, basically, what happens is that each zero axis malware instance contains inside of it a configuration file. And this configuration file includes a list of 256 IPs, 256 IP addresses. And so what will happen is when you have a new host, let's say there's a new host here and he's infected, uh, he's going to basically appeal to this list and figure out where he can connect. And maybe he'll find out that he can connect uh, to this guy and, and to this guy. And he'll form connections with these nodes. Okay, And then once he forms connections with these nodes, if it's successful, he's now officially part of the botnet. And one of the first things that happens when he becomes part of the botnet is that he can now receive updated lists of IP addresses. So this list had some initial IP addresses on it. It can now be updated with a more up-to-date list that might be taken from some of these other nodes. Like, for example, some nodes may have left the botnet at that time. Uh, new nodes may have joined. And so having an up-to-date list of peers that he can connect to is a very valuable thing. And then when future nodes connect, they too can get access to more up-to-date lists of peers. I do want to point out there are actually two kinds of nodes uh, in zero access when it comes to uh, this peer-to-peer -peer botnet. You have what we call regular nodes, uh, regular nodes, and you also have what are called uh, super nodes. Okay, and the difference between them is that super nodes are nodes that can be directly accessed on the internet, whereas regular nodes cannot be directly accessed. For example, let's say this is a regular node right here. This node may be sitting behind. Uh, a network address translation device, a NAT device, and as such it cannot be directly accessed or typically cannot be accessed easily and directly from the outside. Super nodes on the other hand are nodes that have let's say a public facing IP address and they can be accessed. Now the reason I bring up this distinction is that uh, when, you, when you think about it, bot masters actually use super nodes as the initial seeding point for new malware. So let's say they have uh, a new piece of malware, let's say a new click fraud trojan or a new uh, spam trojan they want to push out to the entire network, what they'll do is they'll seed that trojan or that piece of malware, that malicious payload, onto the super nodes. And remember, they have access to the super nodes because super nodes can be accessed externally. And then the idea is that the internal or the regular nodes can then access these new updates from the super nodes. And so as a result, the super nodes really help facilitate the propagation of malicious payloads throughout the entire peer-to-peer -peer botnet. Okay, without that, it would the botnet would not be very useful. Okay, now I do want to point out a couple of things in relation to these files and, and these nodes, and these are mostly minor things, but they are actually important. Uh, the first is that um, all the files that are transmitted do come with a digital signature, so the authenticity of the file can be checked, and again, that's a mechanism that uh, typically is used uh, in the context of being able to ensure that the right thing is uh, is executed. You wouldn't want uh, some malicious party to somehow be able to propagate a file throughout the network, and so this is a way to prevent that from happening. Okay. And also, I do want to point out that the encryption between the peers, let's say between different peers in this peer-to-peer -peer network, is encrypted using RC4, uh, which is a well-known encryption algorithm. Uh, RC4, and actually what's interesting is that the key that's used is a universal key, and so really every every user or every peer actually has the same copy of a key, so it's not a, a difficult uh, thing to, to reverse because if you have if everyone has a copy of the key, then um, it's easy to find this key, and as a result, it's easy to figure out what the communications are, but they are encrypted at the outset using this particular key. All right, that's really what I wanted to say about the way that zero access works from a peer-to-peer -peer botnet perspective. I'm going to stop this video right here. and Hopefully this video series gave you a good grasp of how zero access works in general and what it does.